Hello. Thank you. This afternoon, my wife, Ramona, and I walked out on the football field. We spent about 15 minutes out there, and I think I was on the field more this afternoon than I was when I played here. <laughs> you know, when you're an all-conference linebacker in high school, and then you come to college, and everybody's big and fast, and I was small and slow, you sit the bench. And when you're so far ahead, no one can catch up. Tiny Grant, now some of you know Tiny. He's not tiny. He would turn to the bench, and this is what he would ask. This is my new position, by the way. Is there anybody that hasn't played? That was my position. <laughs> Before I begin tonight, a couple things. Number one, I want to thank Steve Davis for inviting me to come. What a visionary. Could you please put your hands together and thank him for spearheading this event? Thank you, Steve. You met Spence a moment ago. It's Spence's vision at the LDS College that started this process. Give Spence a big applause, please. And there's one more group. We've had the privilege of being served by students, Ramona and I by John and Katrina Jacobs. John Jacob Jingle, that's how I remembered his name. And look around the room at the technical people. Those that are broadcasting this, for those who are at home, we welcome you. The students who have given hundreds of hours to make this possible. I'm going to ask you to stand up for a moment and give them an applause that they can feel for the sacrifice that they've made. Would you join me in doing that? Just right to your feet. I think they felt that. Thank you. Thank you. Not lastly, but most importantly, I want to introduce you to my sweetheart, Ramona. She's down here on the front row. Would you stand, sweetheart, and turn and let everybody see you? Hmm. The mother of our seven children. Two nights ago, number 26 was born. In a month, number 27 will be born, our grandchildren. You want to know about Ramona, just know that Thursday morning after that birth at 5 o'clock in the morning, she awoke and the first thing on her mind was, I want to go to the temple and celebrate the birth of this healthy grandchild. I want all of you to know what is possible when you commit all of you in a relationship, when there is trust, and may I be so bold, with sacred intimacy, the ultimate expression of that commitment and trust. It can be glorious and it can be wonderful and celestial. I have often wondered what it would be like to interview the prodigal son. Can you imagine? I'd want to know what happened before he left home. What kind of friends did he have? What kind of social pressure did he face? I'd want to ask him, what is the single most important event that occurred in your journey? I think he'd want to tell us there are three. 
Number one, it might sound like this. There I was feeding the swine. <laughs> and I'm hungry, and I'm allowed to eat the stalks that they're eating. I grab one, a pig's fighting me for it. I flick off a couple maggots, and I take a bite. And I realize I've just hit rock bottom. And I came to myself. I came to myself. I had this epiphany. It's like the heavens open, and I saw something I had never seen before. May I suggest to all of you that the first step in becoming is coming to yourself, wherever that might be. He'd probably tell us number two. I want you to watch this. He would tell you that I turned from the pigsty, pig stall, and I faced the house of my father. Number two. And I began to walk toward his house. Number three. I think he would tell us. I was still quite a ways from my father's home, and he saw me, and he ran toward me, and he threw his arms around me, and he kissed my neck, and he wept. I think he would tell us that he fell to his own knees and said, Father, I have sinned against heaven. And in thy sight, I am no longer worthy to be called thy son. And I think his father lifted him and held him. I love you, son. Then he asked his servant, bring me the best robe. And he put it on his right shoulder. And he gave him a ring a symbol of his inheritance, and gave him shoes so that he could walk a different path in more comfort. May we set as the first bookend of this convention right here. I am going to come to myself. This is a choice you will want to make. I can't make you nor can anyone else. This is a personal decision. I'm going to come to myself. I'm going to turn and face the house of the Lord, and I'm going to begin my journey trusting that when he sees me, he will run and hold me and kiss me. I bear witness that he will. For the other bookend, ever since Steve asked me to come, I have had one scripture on my mind. My wife and I have read this together numerous times, the full meaning of which I'm just beginning to understand. We find it in the first chapter of Moses. Here, this, the glory of the Lord comes upon Moses. He's carried away to an exceedingly high mountain, and he's shown the creations of God. Not all. That would require all of his glory to come upon him, and he would not have been able to remain in the flesh, he says. But he saw these things, and he was called, Moses, thou son of God. And if we are to liken the Scriptures unto ourselves, Katie, Thou daughter of God. Feel that. Then the glory withdrew, and Moses was left to himself. And it took a while to regain his strength. That's what happens when we have an experience of that magnitude. And when he had come to himself, come to himself, Moses, seeing the glory of God 
in comparison to where he was, he said, now I know that man is nothing. Not that I am worthless. I just have a journey ahead of me. And then Lucifer came calling. Lucifer. Worship me, Moses, thou son of man. Moses was astonished. He could look upon Satan with the natural eye. Why should I worship you? The glory of the Lord had to come upon me to see his face. I can see yours with my natural eye. Why should I worship you? Depart from me. Lucifer did not want to leave. There's a clue there for all of us if we like this scripture unto ourselves. And Moses got to see the bitterness of hell. And then he finally cast him out. And then he prayed for that glory to come upon him again, and it did. And, the, and God showed him every particle of this earth on which he dwelt, every person he discerned. And then God gave Moses, as he did to all of us, the other bookend. Come to yourself. And then he said, Moses, my work and my glory is to bring to pass the immortality of man. That means we're going to have a Savior come to the earth, live a perfect life, go to Gethsemane, take upon himself all of our transgressions, our pain, our frustration, the pain of which we know not. He was so exquisite than to be hung on a cross until he died, put in a sepulcher, resurrected on the third day, breaking the bonds of death so that our spirit and body could be reunited. That was his choice, to take that bitter cup and drink it and bring to pass your immortality. The second is your decision and eternal life of man. What does that mean? Does it mean just to live with God? Remember, when the glory of God came upon Moses, he saw all of his creations. Moses, I want you to see the possibilities of what I want you to become. I want you to become a creator a creator. There is your other bookend. Come to ourselves. Become a creator. And for right now, we are in mortality, and in mortality, we're in a laboratory. This is the laboratory of creation. And the hereafter, we will create spiritually and then physically. Here, we create mentally and then physically. Mentally. It's no wonder that King Benjamin said, watch your thoughts. It's no wonder that jo excuse me, Jacob, in the second chapter, is about to deliver one of the most challenging admonitions. But he starts it with this. As of yet, you have been obedient to the law that I've taught you. Then he goes on to tell us that an all-seeing God has shown unto him their thoughts, that they have begun to labor in sin, which is most abominable to God. If this is a laboratory, and if it's an opportunity for us to learn how to create, if it's a place where we are challenged to obey God's law, not because it's restrictive, because it is the invitation to ultimate freedom, then it is incumbent on all of us to become very aware of the thoughts we entertain. 
I've had the privilege to help perfect the formal mathematical science of axiological mathematics. For you math students, it uses Cantor's transfinite calculus and the concept of infinitudes. What's important to know is this, for the first time, we're able to measure with extreme accuracy how someone thinks. Not what they think, but how they think. What are their habits of thinking? Which thought processes are supporting them and which thought processes bring darkness into their life? We've identified that with millennials, you have four or five thought processes in common. There have been those before you who shared these, and they were generally entrepreneurial in nature, very independent thinkers. We've got an entire generation with these gifts, an entire generation. I'm going to take what little time I have left to share with you these thoughts. If you want to chuckle every once in a while, that would be okay too. Thank you. First thought, 98%. It's no wonder we coined a phrase in the office, profit with a purpose. When you're working with millennials, you want to create profit with a purpose. They want to do something that is meaningful with their life. They don't want to just go to work every day, eight to five, and work, 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 work. There's got to be a reason for it. High levels of empathy and intuition, very high. Now, if I were Lucifer, hmm, I'd be working on you, getting you to focus on yourself, having you question your worth and worthiness, your ability, your beliefs. I'd have engaged in all kinds of thought processes, anything to keep you from accessing this enormous capacity to step into someone's world and see clearly what they're struggling with. What a gift. You will want to know how to use it. Second thought. Oh, this one is interesting. 99.5. Now, this is where you might want to chuckle. 99.5 are intrinsically resisting structure. <laughs> Woohoo! We have an entire generation of problem solvers. Not rule followers, problem solvers. Please forgive us. We're just learning how to talk to you. <laughs> we grew up in have to, should, must, need to, ought to, fear of consequences if we don't. You grow up in want to, get to, choose to, and if you can't choose, you don't do. Wow. You want to raise the hair up on the back of your neck, tell you something you have to do. You need to do this. Here's an admission. Many of us who profess to be adults <laughs> are not necessarily reaping the rewards from following the rules because we do it because we have to, we should, we must. We might as well sit down with our neighbor and say, would you like to join my church? I have to pay 10% tithing, I have to pay fast offering, I have to go to church on Sunday, I need to do my home teaching, I, it ties up my whole Sunday, I'm exhausted when it's over with, I'm angry with my children a lot of the time, you should see us trying to get ready for church, wouldn't you love to have this? And your generation says, let me find a higher purpose. Let me structure, look at structure as a support mechanism for a higher purpose. Congratulations, you got the math right. Because it's not about have to, should, and must. It's not about obedience for obedience sake. We obey 
because it makes sense when we want this. Ninety-seven percent of you are obsessively thinking. What do you do to shut off your minds? A couple of risks. If you're here with a companion, don't poke their ribs too hard. The single greatest risk is you'll get attached to your ideas, you'll feel really strongly about them, and you'll need to be right. This causes a challenge because you step out into the workforce of corporate America and you start at the bottom of the rung and you come with all kinds of ideas and nobody wants to hear them from you. And 96% of the time, your idea is inextricably connected to your self-esteem. They're calling into question my worth. They're calling into question my ability. They're calling into question my values. No, they're just systemic and they need to be right. They haven't figured out yet how to look for the good in your idea and how to intrinsically validate you and draw from your gifts. We will figure it out. Give us some time, please. But just know when you step out, you're going to run into that. Don't quit your job just because your manager doesn't know how to step into your world and find good in your idea the first week that you're there. Be prepared. Lastly, the ability to vividly visualize. Vividly visualize. Some of them might say, well, I, I don't know that I do that. And I go, well, wherever you spend time alone, interrupt yourself. Driving in the car, lying in bed at night, getting up in the morning, walking in between classes. Where is your mind? Stop and go, where am I? Oh, my goodness. I almost told you something I did here at Rick's, but it's still a secret, so I'll leave it there. <laughs> See, Ensign Hall, used to be Ensign Hall, and Rigby are right next to each other. And there was always this unspoken feud. It has something to do with a skunk that got put down the stairs by the intake vent and emptied the building. <laughs> anyway, you didn't hear it from me. I just heard about it. Here's the challenge. In today's world, our secret desires, our real intentions, often cause us to use this enormous gift. You see it? To vividly visualize. To use this enormous gift destructively. 98% of the time. And when we do, we get to witness the bitterness of hell, the darkness of the dark one. Yet, if we use it constructively, we get to experience the glory of the Lord. What governs this? We turn to the 121st section of the Doctrine and Covenants. Let virtue Garnish thy thoughts unceasingly. Ennobling thoughts, preceded by, let your bowels be full of charity toward all men and to the household of faith. Charity, we've got to go to the Greeks to have a full understanding, because charity is often translated into the word love. They had four words for love, eros, pia, philo, agape. Eros, erotic love. Pia, maternal love. Philo, brotherly love. Agape, a heightened level of awareness. Charity, the pure love of Christ. Yes, his ability to see us in total, free of bias, free of prejudice, unconditional. To look at situations differently. That when something happens that's unpleasant, instead of going into resistance and resentment and frustration with agape, charity, we'll see it for what it is, a tremendous opportunity to learn, an opportunity to show up in a way that we inspire others to show up in their challenges, and an opportunity to take all of that experience, the most awful, ugly things that have happened in our lives, out of the sack we drag around and put it in our hearts so that we can listen differently, 
hear things other people don't hear. When's the last time someone cared enough about you to listen until you felt understood and they didn't try to fix you? When was the last time that happened for you? It is so rare. That's having our bowels full of charity. We come to a conversation without an agenda. We focus on the infinite worth of the human being and we listen. And our thoughts are filled with ennobling thoughts. That's virtuous thoughts. We want to engage in life. We want to embrace principles. We want to connect. We want to serve. We want to create value. We want to contribute to the world. What a living footprint. We want this to matter. Can you feel that energy? Compare that with, I just want to escape life. I just want to have enough money. I don't have to worry about anything. I don't really want to stretch and grow and become. I just want it to be manifest. I want to receive it. I want to get it. That's darkness at one of its highest levels. Instead, I want to engage and embrace and connect and serve and create value and contribute. What can I create? How can I create that? How will that serve? You are in God's playground doing His work and His glory, and He rewards you with inspired ideas and impressions and solutions to challenges. If I had you wired to a functional MRI, we would see parts of your brain light up that are normally dormant in a human being. When you receive one of those inspired ideas, it ignites your passion and Passion is the gift we're given to do the work of creation. Absent passion, work's just boring, mundane, repetitive, burdensome, and hard. Over here, we'll work without counting the cost or tracking the time. We'll do whatever's required to create intangible reality, that which we've seen in our mind, because as we do this, And these inspired ideas come, and we treat them as urgent assignments, and we act on them, and we create things we would not have had otherwise. We trust and are trusted. We know and are known. Our confidence waxes strong in the presence of God. That's how it happens. And then the doctrine of the priesthood will distill upon your heads the dew from heaven, freely given. And the Holy Ghost will be your constant companion. You are engineered from birth to do this. However, if your secret desires are just to have a life of ease, no more pain, no more stress, no more frustration, you're playing in Lucifer's playground. One, that doesn't exist on this planet. And two, When you go over here and you skip all the stretching and growing, becoming, and in your mind you vividly visualize what it's going to be like when your school loans are paid off, when you have this incredible spouse and children, when you are the CEO of the company six months after you graduate, (laughs) and you start to do this, just watch this step. I start to go just a little bit beyond the event, and I start to vividly visualize what it's going to be like then. And norepinephrine starts to course through my sympathetic nervous system. That's a euphoric drug. If it were prescribed, it would be a controlled substance. Neuroscientists call it a mental construct. We, we start building a new reality in our mind. It's so real that when life shows up differently, Bam, our body goes into this autonomic response. That's more than automatic. It means something you cannot control. It releases cortisol. Everybody do this with me together. Go, just go that. One more time. One, two, three. Ever had one of those? That's your gift for going into fantasy. Something happened that was unexpected. It gets worse. In your midbrain, your fight or flight center, your amygdala sends out an army of fear dendrites and starts shutting down your prefrontal cortex, your empathy, intuition, practical judgment, common sense, your memory center, your hippocampus gets shut down, nothing in, nothing out. 
You're rendered emotionally paralyzed. Next time you find yourself in that space, come to yourself and be accountable where you've been in your mind. What was your secret desire and real intention 12 hours ago? Was it to engage and embrace and connect and serve and create value and contribute? Were you searching for what you could create and how you could create it and how it would serve? Or were you just wanting to skip all of this and get and receive and take? Oh, the message is in the world that vivid visualization manifests tangible reality. That is a lie. What vivid visualization does when we use it constructively. It opens the windows of heaven and God comes to the stage of our mind and gives us a gift, an inspired idea. That impression, that solution to a challenge ignites our passion and drives our focus, discipline, effort, and action. That's how we create mentally and then physically. Nobody gets to skip the work. No one gets to skip the work. There's one. You don't want to do this one. The next one, catastrophe. This is when we go into worst-case scenarios. I'm going to fail that exam. I'm going to get kicked out of school. My father's going to cut off my tuition. I'm going to be homeless, and I'm going to be working at the Safeway the rest of my life. And then we find out the grade wasn't so bad, and we get to go, ah. 95% of the pathology present in 65-year-olds or older is caused by the chronic release of cortisol due to chronic worrying. Who do you think might want you to do that? See the darkness. Compare it to the glory of God who wants nothing more than to inspire you to take action, to create. Lastly, and this one, this one's a tender one. In the second chapter of Jacob, Jacob took this one on. He said, as of yet, You've been obedient to the laws that I've taught you. And he's talking about what they're thinking. Go back and read 2 Jacob tonight in terms of the discussion around concubines. And ask yourself, could this be a 2,400-year-old sermon on pornography addiction? Could it be? Because one of the deadliest uses of this vivid visualization is to go somewhere on the internet. You should never be if you want the Holy Ghost as a constant companion. With all the tenderness of my heart, I want you to know that this happens not because you're evil. You've just used an enormous gift destructively. Don't try to suppress this urge. You'll be in a systemic right, wrong, win, lose, life, death, battle. You will never win. Oh, maybe a week or two at a time. Go back and look at your secret desires and real intentions and choose to engage in life and embrace principles to connect and serve and create value and contribute to the world. Start using this vivid visualization in God's playground where he can give you an inspired idea that will ignite your passion and then bring that passion into the world and create. And when you have created something you did not have before, you will see the glory of the Lord and you'll look at that and see the darkness and you will not want it. You will cast it out of your life. You will not spend time there. You'll spend time here. This is a gift. It is so vivid with some of you. It's not less vivid. Oh, I've got to be careful. Please hear this carefully. I don't want to say something I get in trouble with with the brethren. 
it can be as vivid as a prophet sees. Prophet sees for the whole world, right? You can see for your own life, for that of a companion, your children, your career, your church calling. You can see as clearly the difference between this gift with someone who's just getting started and a prophet is this. The prophet knows the source of his seeing. He has confidence in the presence of God. He knows the source of his seeing. You will want to know the source of your seeing. This is the generation that is to see dreams and visions. This is the group that's supposed to inspire the world. You're going to want to grab this gift of all of them. Marry it with your empathy and intuition and seek for ways to serve. Write down one thing if you would and exercise it over this weekend as many times as you can. If there's anyone I can serve, if there's anyone I can serve, what that means, I, me, and all of my experience, you've all got vast experience from your childhood, from your classrooms. What is unique? What have you struggled with? What have you overcome? What battles have you fought? <laughs> I'll leave that one alone. <laughs> if there's anyone I can serve, put them on my path and I will serve them. Stay in this space this weekend as you're in this meeting and listening. See people who sit next to you. Step into their world. Strike up a conversation. Put aside your fear, your anxiety, your sense of aloneness that you may experience. Step into someone's world. You never know where they've been or where they are, but you feel inspired to do so, you'll discover there's a purpose, and you'll feel so good about yourself because you use the gift that God gave you to serve another an impression. And my promise to you is this. Those impressions will become increasingly significant. I remember one day sitting at my office, and a name kept coming to my mind. I was coaching all day. I didn't have a big enough window of time to make the phone call. And finally it came, and I called him, and I said, how are you doing? I hadn't talked to him for a year and a half. He said, I'm great. Then why can't I get your name off my mind? I trust the source of my seeing. Silence. I waited for him. And he finally said, do you really want to know? And I said, I'm here to serve you. And he began to tell me the most horrific story. Everything in a marriage and a life and a business that go wrong had gone wrong and to the extremes in every case. 1989, 88, and 89, the collapse of the real estate market in Southern California took away our net worth, millions of dollars. We were left with a million dollars in debt. We spent the next 10 years paying it back. I felt moments during that time that were so suffocating. I even at one time came really close to the edge of mortality. And as I listened, I knew why I'd been inspired to call because when he finished, I asked one question. How seriously are you considering suicide? And this adult male broke into tears. It is all I've been thinking about. We flew him up to Utah the next day, spent the afternoon together. I wasn't the only one who came. This isn't about me. 
This is just about that moment when you're asking, if there's anyone I can serve, put them on my path and I'll serve them. It may not always be this drastic. It rarely is. But when it is, it is absolutely amazing. When he came to my house, I found out he was planning it that night. You see, God knows these things. And if you use your gift of vivid visualization to go into your mind and ask for answers... These are great questions. If there's anyone I can serve, put them on my path and I'll serve them. Please, show me. Impression. Act on it. Gain increasing levels of trust. Our Father in heaven loves you. That's why he gave you this gift. If it's been used in fantasy, let it go. If it's been used in catastrophe, let it go. If it's been used in counterfeit forms of mental pleasure, let it go. Use it. Use it. And become. Create with it. And become. Use this laboratory to become, to stretch and grow. Ogmandino began the ten scrolls and the greatest salesman in the world with these words. Today, And you can say, October 10th, 2014, today I began a new life. Today I shed my old skin, which have too long suffered the bruises of failure and the wounds of mediocrity. Today I am born anew, and my birthplace is a vineyard where there is fruit for all. May you have the courage to use the gifts you've been given the way they're designed, that you might taste the glory of God so that you will avoid the darkness of Lucifer. Come to yourself. Know where you're headed and why you're going there. No matter what you do as a living, you can live this way so long as it's honorable. I want to bear my witness to you that what I've spoken to you is true. Don't be deceived. Use your gifts properly. Have those experiences. I love you all. We have prayed for you. We have wept for you in preparation for tonight. May God's choicest blessings be with you. Thank you.